Hi everyone, hope you're doing well. We've got three stories in this video. The first two are Bigfoot encounters and they're extremely interesting. The last story is about a cryptid that you may have never heard about. It was extremely interesting to me. I had not ever heard of this thing. And we've got an email and an encounter from a man who has seen one, him and his grandfather and his uncle actually encounter this thing. And hang with me to the end of the video because you're gonna love this story. All right, here we go. Here is an encounter sent to me by a woman in New Jersey, or the encounter happened in New Jersey, and it happens back in the 1970s, and she remembers it like it was yesterday, and it's really scary. This is one of those encounters where you see it so clear in your mind, and you know what happened, but no one else wants to believe you, and I kind of feel for her towards the end of this story, but it's... uh it's pretty scary. And so she writes, I just came across your YouTube channel today and wanted to share my Bigfoot encounter with you too. Please don't use my name, but you can use where I'm from. Thanks again. I grew up in New Jersey in the 1970s, in Monmouth County to be exact. My neighborhood was next to an elementary school, which was surrounded at the time by a farm across the street from the school an old rotting house that was in the woods behind the school, and then nothing but acres upon acres of woods, easily several thousands of acres. Many weird things happened as a child in that area, hearing whistles from the woods, having small pebbles thrown at us from the woods, and as children, we'd often hang out at the school field near the edge of the woods, occasionally smelling a wet dog smell. From time to time, a friend and I would venture into the woods, which we were told many times by our parents to stay away from those woods. We discovered a trail behind her house one day and walked around this path that went pretty far back. It was a big circle that had a few trails that connected into a main circle, and we never took the side paths, and it was probably a mile around. The neighborhood boys would ride their dirt bikes out there sometimes. The trail itself was about three feet wide with thick woods on each side of this trail. There was enough room for my friend and I to walk side by side. When we'd get to the halfway point, you could no longer see the houses, just the deep woods, and we'd start to get a little creeped out being 10 years old at the time. We continue walking and talking about the silly things that girls talk about. We'd stop and pick honeysuckles or some flowers that we would see, and sometimes we'd begin to smell that wet dog smell. We'd see the tops of fairly tall trees begin to sway when there was no breeze, and maybe a pebble or two would be tossed at us. We thought it was the neighborhood boys or our brothers trying to scare us, but one day we ventured off the trail just a few feet, and we came across a strange giant nest. It looked like a bird's nest, but it was on the ground, not in a tree. It was flat and round, like a dog bed, but had piles of dried grass up around the edges, and we thought that it was weird. We just backed up, got on the path we had been on, and hurried out of the woods. Not long after that, a new neighborhood was starting to be built on the side of the school field opposite of our neighborhood. We would explore over there sometimes too, and one day we came across this huge footprint. It was very long, and the toe prints were almost rectangular in shape. We held our feet next to it, and they weren't even close to a third the size of that track. We never told anyone about the tracks or about the things that we had seen in the woods as we would have been punished for being where we were supposed to be. A couple of months later, this friend and her family moved away. As I got older, probably 14 or 15, I had asked other friends if they had seen anything in the woods before, and only one friend admitted that he had seen something. It was at the opposite end of these same woods, probably 15 miles away or so. And we walked out there looking for it one day and never found anything. But it was comforting to know that someone else had heard and seen the things that I had. Moving forward to the fall of 1981, 
My boyfriend and I took a walk to sneak a cigarette or two in before my parents took him home. We were walking around the school field skirting along the edge of the woods, and we were there for about 15 or 20 minutes. It was starting to get dark, so we were heading back toward my house. We were facing each other when something caught my eye. I had to look past him to see this thing clearly. He seemed puzzled by the look on my face. What I saw was on a hill that was on the side of the school field, probably 50 yards away from us. I saw this person, but it wasn't a person. It was like a giant gorilla, but it was different. Yes, it was dusk. Yes, eyes play tricks on people. But this was no imaginary trick of the eye. This was a seven or eight foot tall creature with long reddish brown fur. It stood there just staring in our direction and then suddenly it charged at us. I could feel my eyes widen in shock as I saw this creature running towards us at full speed. In a second, it was halfway to us. I just yelled, run to him, and we ran through a neighbor's backyard to my house, and in a panic, I ran into the house and told my mom that something had chased us. I was shaking and scared half to death. I told her to lock the doors, and she thought I was crazy. She said it was probably just some kid in the neighborhood playing around, and I tried to tell her what I saw, but she didn't want to hear any of it. My boyfriend didn't see it either, and I couldn't even hear it running towards us, no pounding of its feet on the ground, but it ran like the wind, and I know if we had stayed there, it would have hurt us. The next day, my boyfriend had his friend drive us over to the school field with me where we saw this creature. I pointed and was visibly shaking in the car. I did not want to get out. I begged them not to get out, so we just drove away, and that's probably the last time I went over there before I graduated high school and moved away. It's one day I'll never forget, and I can still remember vividly exactly what I saw, how it ran, and just the aggressive nature of this creature. I know what I saw that day, and I know what it was. It was a Bigfoot. Ma'am, that's a, that's a great story, and... I wonder if you've ever considered if that was a dog man. You know, some people would hear this story and they might say, with the nest on the ground, and I don't know, maybe Bigfoot make nests like that too. I've heard that before. Either way, this is a great and terrifying story, and I really appreciate you sending it in. Thank you. This next story is hair-raising uh, I, re- I read through it and I was like, oh my gosh, this is crazy. So it's sent in by Daryl and he's, he's recounting a story that a friend told him. And he writes, this is a true story told to me by one of my best friends who wishes to remain anonymous. This story takes place about one year ago on Lake Marion, the smaller of twin lakes in Berkeley County, South Carolina. The lakes are very large and have a vast amount of forested area surrounding both with all types of wildlife including deer, alligators, fox, raccoons, and all the typical forest animals. My girlfriend and I were sitting on the rear deck of our home after nightfall having a beer after work one evening when I heard something splashing through the swamp directly behind my yard. My girlfriend said, man, that's a big deer to make all those noises. And then it dawned on me that it's only on two legs splashing through the water. Hurricane Matthew had passed a month before, and a lot of the woods were submerged in standing water and down pine trees. I was just in there the day before with waders, and the water was up to my hip. You could clearly hear two large feet clearing the water and splashing down with each step. I thought to myself, there's no way I could pick my feet up to clear the water as deep as it is. So whatever it is... Is very, very tall and big by the sound of the splash. The noise stopped behind my utility building 15 yards away from the woods in my backyard. My girlfriend went into the house and got a handgun and a light, and we both walked down to the building to see what it was. She walks faster than me, so she was ahead by about 10 yards. As she rounded the corner of the building, she threw the gun and the light down and passed me screaming, running back to the house. She didn't stop on the deck. She ran all the way into the house, and as she got there, she locked the doors and was screaming and crying. 
I asked her, what did you see? And she said, all I know is it was very big and black. She said the thing jumped flat-footed on top of a down pine tree. If you're not familiar with a pine tree, they just don't blow over. They have a long tap root, so they break off about 6 to 10 feet high, and the tree just falls over. One end was suspended from the ground by the limbs and the other still connected to the small stump. Altogether, the tree trunk was about six to seven feet above the ground. It ran the length of the tree right before the limbs started and it jumped back off into the swamp and you could hear it tearing through the water and trees as it was leaving. Up until this point, I never really thought about Bigfoot. All I knew about Bigfoot was what a friend of mine named Fuzzy used to tell me. About a month later, I was sitting alone on my back deck right after dark when I heard something messing around behind my building. It was knocking propane cylinders together, and you could hear the clank clank as they hit one another. I got up to walk back there to see what it was. About halfway to the shed, a 32-foot Werner extension ladder came flying over my shed, over my head, and landed about 10 yards behind me with a huge racket. A ladder of that length is very, very heavy and bulky. I didn't hesitate. I turned around and flew back to my house, locking the door behind me. That scared me enough to put in a security system complete with infrared night cameras. A week or two later, I was getting ready for work early one morning. I happened to glance down at the monitor, and there was something standing in front of the burn barrel that I had a fire in the previous night, and you could still see the glow from the heat. The barrel was sitting on top of four cement blocks almost completely full of wet ash, and it was really heavy. So the previous night, I built a pretty good-sized fire right on top of the wet ash, and on top of the barrel, which was a 55-gallon drum, and the top was about four and a half feet off the ground. The creature I saw stood there silhouetted against the glow from the fire with its back to the camera, clearly at least five foot taller than the top of the barrel. Just then it leaned down with its face close to the opening and evidently the smoke and heat got in its eyes and made it really mad. The creature stooped down beside the barrel grabbing it with both hands on the cool bottom portion of the drum and threw it at least 15 yards, leaving a big dent in the ground when it landed, and wet ash and sparks spilling out all over, and it ran back into the swamp. I couldn't believe the width of its shoulders. It looked like it was five feet across the back, and V-shaped to a narrow waist and massive arms and legs. We've not seen it since, but we hear it every now and then. Fuzzy told me they had sightings in every state except Hawaii, now, I am a believer. <laughs> I, I think I would be a believer too. I cannot imagine looking in a monitor and seeing this huge animal silhouetted against the glow of a burn barrel. That's spooky, man. Daryl, thanks for sending that in. That was a great encounter. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. This last story is awesome. The man writes me an email and he wants to remain anonymous and I don't blame him. He is 68 years old, and he's recounting an event that happens in 1958. He's never shared this with anyone other than one person. And he writes, my story is from 1958 when I was a farm kid in central Illinois. My grandfather was a large acreage farmer. He and his brother farmed over 3,000 acres, which had been in the family from the 1700s around Warrensburg, Illinois. To frame the happening of that day, I will say my grandfather was a larger-than-life man, president of the Farm Bureau and Lions Club. He was Illinois skeet shooting champion, a pilot with his own plane, boats, and all the newest farm equipment. He bought a new pink Cadillac every two years. I think he liked being larger than life. I was his oldest grandson, and he took me everywhere with him. I even helped him deliver a breech calf with his jeep and a chain at six years old. When we crash landed his Cessna in a field rolling into a creek, he made me swear I would never tell my grandmother, and I never did. To say he was a serious, no-nonsense man would be understating his nature. He was not prone to small talk or wasting time, and with that, I'll get on with the story. 
Warrensburg, Illinois, in 1958 was a small farm town, the center of a farming area like so many Midwest farm towns. Tractor suppliers, farm supplies, a general store, and school or two with a population of 59. It lays 29 miles northeast of Blue Mound, Illinois, with its history of curses and mysterious doom that permeated the area for hundreds of miles around over hundreds of years. Today, I looked it up on the internet to find not a mention of that past other than the storied up crop failures that ruined farmers for over a hundred years in Blue Mound. While other area crops were bountiful, farmer after farmer met financial ruin in Blue Mound at the hands of mysterious crop failures. Blue Mound is an ancient American Indian burial ground. My maternal grandmother was a full-blood Cherokee Indian. She wouldn't go near Blue Mound. We were told the Indians buried not their dead, but the bodies of their wicked enemies, the giants they warred with for many years. There's an oddly high ground in the middle of the flat plains where no one was allowed to farm or excavate by law for nearly a hundred years. I imagine due to the bones of giants that would be unearthed. The ill-fated stories of those who dared to dig in Blue Mound are many. Legend has it due to a curse by the Indian medicine man placed on the dead buried there. I can tell you my one trip through there as a child, even before I knew the legends, was unsettling to say the least. One sunny fall day, my grandfather, my uncle, and I were out in a field by our creek bird hunting. I was a kid with my eye in the sky most of the time. I loved birds, planes, and all things that flew. I still do. It's no wonder I ended up a private pilot. As I was watching the crows fight and fly in and out of the large elm tree by the creek, I noticed a plane in the distance. I began watching it as it approached on a path that would take it directly overhead. It would be a video image burned in my brain for all my life. When it was about a mile away, judging by its proximity to the North 100 Acres fence line, I thought I was seeing things. This plane flapped its wings like a bird. I yelled at my granddad, look at the plane, it's flapping its wings. As he turned and said, planes don't flap their wings, son, you know that. With you know that fading in volume as he saw the plane flap its wings. Suddenly it dawned on me that this was a bird. It was a huge bird. It was probably at around 500 feet altitude. My grandfather had a Cessna and flew over the farm regularly at about the same altitude. The wingspan of this bird was at least double that of his Cessna. The body was twice as long and three times as wide as the Cessna's fuselage. The sun was at the perfect angle to see it was feathered with a huge beak almost appearing as a huge eagle. We stood in awe as it approached rapidly, flapping its huge wings every now and then. Suddenly, my dimwit uncle, known for his poor hunting etiquette, aims his shotgun at this huge bird. My grandfather grabs his barrel, shoving it into the dirt as it fires. My grandfather was in a rage, I think partially because of Uncle Dimwit and partly from fear because he was a man that didn't scare. I had never seen a look of fear on his face until that moment. I knew well his look of anger as he had a short temper and little tolerance for stupidity. He yanked me under his arm and fell to the ground, telling my uncle to get down. The bird gave a head turn notice to the gunfire and then continued on. When the bird had gone about a mile past, my grandfather let me up and lit into my uncle. Are you out of your effing mind? Do you know what that is? I still have a hundred head of cattle and pigs and sheep and your wife's horses. My uncle was wisely silent as he well knew setting off my granddad had earned him more than one punch in the face. Grandpa's rage was different than this. He was really upset over my uncle's attempt to shoot this bird upset and scared. To this day, I think he knew far more about the giant bird and its actions than he ever told me. He was truly worried about his livestock. We never discussed it after that day. Sadly, my hero died of cancer four years after this incident, just before my 12th birthday. But on this day, as he cooled, I waited for a minute, and then I asked, what was that, Grandpa? 
He turned and held my shoulders, looking me in the eye. You can't ever tell anyone what I'm about to tell you because they will think you're crazy. Promise me that you won. And I agreed. He began, You know, that bird was flying toward Blue Mound, right? Yes, I replied. We have forever heard the tales of the giant bird the Indians call the Thunderbird. I thought it was just a story about the eagle the Indians worshipped. He said, Today I know the Thunderbird is real. I didn't tell him, but my maternal Cherokee grandmother had told me about the Thunderbird. According to legend, Thunderbird would fly over Blue Mound to see if someone had disturbed it. True or not, I don't know. What I do know is at the time Blue Mound and its lore were much respected. I spent years looking into the sky to hopefully see the Thunderbird again, but I never did. Later, I would read about the Thunderbird and have no doubt I have been very fortunate in life to see it. I love the encounters about Dogman and Bigfoot that you share, which I firmly believe in, as my father, uncle, and grandfather, who hunted the southern state, suddenly and mysteriously stopped going to those places. After their last trip, my dad told me stories of the big cats that would scream and sound just like a woman, and he warned me to never go to help out if I was in the woods and heard those sounds, because the people that went in to help seldom returned. He, like my grandfather, wasn't afraid of anything, but he warned me to stay out of the forest and run if I was ever in them and heard the big cat screaming like a woman. I decided long ago that he knew it wasn't big cats, but didn't want to freak out his six-year-old son. As a footnote, the only person besides my wife I ever told this story to was my friend, Watuka Rock Eagle Eye, a full-blooded Navajo Indian. He mentioned Thunderbird one day, and I was just floored. He not only believed me, he said my grandfather was a wise man to heed the warnings that he had heard. Thank you so much for your show and I'd rather not be identified if you don't mind. I've never heard of the Thunderbird, but I thought this was a great story. The man writes really well, he's very descriptive, and it just the story just captured me, and I want to extend my thank you and gratitude to this individual for sending in the story. Okay, that's going to wrap it up for this video. I hope you all enjoyed it, and we'll see you guys next time. Thanks. <music>